Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this intro to policy briefs webinar. I'm Holly Maton. I'm one of the co-directors. I'm the director of programs at the National Science Policy Network. Uh, and for those who have been around for a while, you know we run usually a science policy memo competition every year. Uh, but this year we've changed it up. We're really excited to be partnering with Forefront uh, to launch the policy writing competition, where this year we'll have a different format and we'll invite folks to submit policy briefs. And so in honor of that new partnership uh, and this exciting new format, uh, we've got this webinar that we'll be recording for if other of your friends can't make it, we'll share it on the website and on our YouTube channel after this uh, to tell you a little more about the competition, about what a policy brief is, uh, and hopefully help you guys get started. Um, so with that, I'm going to see if I can turn on the video of our panelists here. With big thanks to both Debbie and Rachel for joining us as the, the co-editors uh, at Forefront. Hey, Rachel, we can see you. All right. Well, thanks so much, Holly. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen and just introduce who Forefront is and then um, We'll kick it over to Debbie, who's going to lead the workshop today. Let's see here. Okay, so um, so I'm Rachel Owen. I am uh, a science policy manager for the Agronomy Crops and Soil Science Society of America. Before that, I um, worked quite a bit in state level policy fellowship programs. I founded the program in Missouri and led that for a couple of years. And it was uh, really exciting to work with Debbie to launch Forefront last year um, as a space uh, where we can more broadly open it up to articles and commentary and analyses on science policy topics um, more broadly than some of the other publication options that are out there in science policy. Um, so I'll let Debbie, I'm gonna, Debbie, I'm going to go ahead and I'll talk about Forefront and then let you introduce yourself when we get to the workshop part. Does that work? Perfect. Okay. So what is Forefront? Um, so as I mentioned, we founded Forefront with the vision of creating a community and a space where anybody from early career scientists and researchers to late career um, researchers and professionals could publish about science and technology policy ideas that would enhance society. Um, we wanted to make it a nimble publication so that we could publish things fairly rapidly. And we wanted to make it pretty open and not overly selective. Um, we just wanted to be able to publish fact-based content. Um, so we decided to um, create this publication on Medium. If you're not familiar, Medium is a blogging platform. Um, it's free and open to anybody. And um, so then we can have any authors um, go ahead and contribute their pieces. We can also republish pieces on Medium. So if you publish a blog about a science policy topic, if you submit a local op-ed, um, you can then republish that on Forefront. We can give um, authorship credit, or we can give credit to the original place it was published, um, but it brings it all into one place. And then we can share that within the community of readers and writers um, at Forefront. We accept all different kinds of formats of fact-based articles. Um, you can publish pretty radical ideas as long as they are fact-based. And we really encourage people to publish things that are newsworthy and related to public, um, current public affairs. Uh, we have the ability to turn things around fairly quickly. Uh, we do have a peer review process, but it, um, it's pretty rapid. And I'll explain a little bit in a minute here how we go through that peer review process. And then we have a team of advisors from many of the major science policy journals, um, like Journal of Science Policy and Governance, um, Noble, uh, Issues in Science and Technology. The, those public leaders in those publications serve as our advisors to help us, you know, to help guide us in where Forefront can go and how it can fit in this niche that doesn't already exist in the science policy space. So I mentioned we do have a, a brief peer review process. Um, we don't go through and uh, you know fact check everything that's in these articles, but we do ask that the articles meet minimum criteria. I'm bringing this up now because these are also the same criteria that we plan to use for the memo or for the um, the policy writing competition with NSPN. And so 
in general, if an article meets these standards um, and also is in the brief format that we're using for this competition, then that's an article that will be considered for the competition and for publishing on the Forefront site. Um, so the article has to fit the scope of Forefront, which is very broadly science and technology ideas that enhance society. It has to be free of all but a free of all but free of, of all but minor grammatical issues. So um, we're not copy editing an article for you. If it's full of spelling errors and grammar errors, we're going to send it back to you and say you need to fix that before we can publish it. it has to be fact based content and you can show that by adding citations throughout um, through hyperlinks or um, our uh, superscripts and referencing those citations. We ask that the articles be formatted fairly, um, fairly well, so that way there aren't major changes that we have to make before we publish it on the site. Uh, the articles have to follow guidelines for appropriate content on Medium. Um, there's a link to that on our on our website that you can that you can read if you're interested in that. Essentially, you can't, you know, uh, be harassing or say inappropriate things in the article. Uh, we ask that you have appropriate tags. If it's an article about agriculture, you add agriculture as your tag. Um, that helps us to categorize those articles. And then we also um, look for some evidence that the author is credible to be writing about that perspective. Um, we ask usually that you submit your LinkedIn page or that you add your bio on, um, on Medium. So that way we have some understanding that you, you know, have credibility as an author in this space it doesn't have to be years of experience by any means, um, just to showcase that you have, you know, that perspective. And like Holly said, um, this year we're really excited to be partnering with NSPN on the policy writing competition. Um, Debbie will talk about policy briefs today. We um, were really excited to explore this new format um, as, a as someone who is preparing to write for policymakers, um, there are lots of different formats that you might be asked to write. And certainly one of the big skills that you're going to have to learn is writing short. Um, and briefs are shorter than memos. They are quick and to the point, but it takes effort to write short. And that's what Debbie is going to talk about today. Um, and we're, we're looking forward to giving you this practice um, through the competition. I see that there are some things in the chat. So let me see if I can answer some quick questions. Um, I might go ahead and answer these questions in the chat and turn it over to Debbie to get her portion started. Um, and it looks like Debbie already started answering them. And so I guess I'll briefly talk about some details of the competition. Um, we'll talk about this again at the end. Uh, can students participate? Absolutely. Any NSPN members are available to participate are, are able to participate in this competition. Um, there's more details on the website. You can use this um, short link here on the slide. Um, and we'll put the link in the chat as well. Um, submissions are due on May 2nd. And we're going to have several events leading up to that that we'll talk about at the end. Um, so feel free to drop your questions in chat about Forefront, about the competition. Um, and me and Holly will work on answering those while Debbie goes ahead and um, talks about policy briefs. Debbie, you are okay. there yep. you go. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so um, I'm so glad you're here today to learn about policy briefs, which is one of my favorite things. Um, so that's why I'm here is first to talk about why they're important to influencing science technology policy and how to write one. So there are like many, many different ways uh, to communicate your your analysis, what it is you're trying to do. Um, I've put together this sort of collection just because over time I've heard that a lot of people um, sort of get confused about all these different methods. So I'm just going to go over them really quickly to, to make it uh, clear. So a policy neutral report is something that might be produced, say, by the Congressional Research Service um, that really takes a neutral stand. It doesn't make recommendations. 
it basically says, okay, here's what's happening in this policy arena. Here are some options for action, but it doesn't go as far as say making recommendations. When you have a policy position article, that might be something that might that could appear say in issues in science and technology. And that is where you're taking a point of view, you're taking a perspective, you're saying, this is the way that I think, uh, I think something should happen. Um, you'll also see these say in Scientific American. Um, so they're sort of basically like a long op-ed, but they're you know, sort of very evidence-based. They're not just opinion. Uh, the policy brief that we're going to uh, talk about today, uh, they, they can vary. Most of them, the most commonly known is say one pagers. That's the most common form, which is one two-sided page. And there, there I just kind of bring together information. It might be based on something that's a lot longer, say a policy report or a white paper, but you're just trying to use them and, and bring them together for say a meeting that you might have uh, with a, a policymaker or with groups, public uh, groups that might be interested in your area. A policy pitch is when you're actually having it, the, the interaction more as a conversation. So the way I think about this is that, you know, you, you go to, you know, some event, you know, like in uh, uh, pre-COVID, we used to have a lot of different activities and, uh, and you meet at your member of Congress and it says, oh, well, like, what are you working on? And you, and you say, oh, well, I'd like to tell you about my research about X, which found Y. And it's a conversation that goes back and forth. Uh, so those you have to be very, very short, like you're talking 30 seconds. And it's not like you have 30 continuous seconds. It's kind of like a, a, a dialogue that you have to sort of pre-plan to do your best at. Um, a science note is something that uh, uh, Rachel and her crew at the, uh, when she was head of the Missouri program, have, uh, have uh, produced a plethora of. And that's just kind of focus on like, here's the facts, ma'am, about the situation. And it's meant so that people are working on the same set of evidence, the same set of facts in a reliable uh, format. A policy memo, unlike these uh, other activities, is generally directed to one person, or uh, maybe it might be a committee or something like that, but it's directed to a specific set of individuals. All these other ones I'm talking about are meant for general audiences. Um, and so you don't really necessarily know who's reading them. With a policy memo, you'll know, you should know who your audience is, a specific person, a specific committee, whoever it might be. And then of course we have things which are not written. So I put videos here, uh, but there's also like obviously many other different ways that you can communicate through social media and things like that. But at the core of all of this, you should have policy analysis where you are, are actually taking a look um, at the facts, at the figures, not, not just, you know, sort of giving, your personal opinion, you know, whatever uh, it might be. Even if you're doing like an op-ed, they'll want, the pre people for whom you submit it are gonna want it to be evidence-based. So uh, I'm policy briefs are probably, I would say my favorite form of communication. Uh, they're brief, they're concise, they're really aimed at government policymakers, but also they can be used by the general public. Most of them are this one pager, that I was talking about, which they talk about here at 700 words, but, um, in, and they have like attractive designs, but there can be longer ones, you'll see them out there. They can be say up to eight pages, you know, 3000 words. But we, for this competition, are only gonna focus on, on the sort of the classic one pager. The other uh, aspect of this that can differ is that there's objective briefs that sort of give balanced information for the policymaker to decide what it is that they would like to do. And there's advocacy briefs that argue and form a, 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 in favor of a particular um, action. Um, so you can do either of these for the competition. Um, I think it's best personally to focus on doing an objective brief because that's um, sort of the more evidence-based uh, uh, action that you kind of need to practice more, but you can do an advocacy brief um, if you would like. Okay, so the policy brief is needs to be short to the point, it has to be very focused on a particular issue. You, you can't cover like, oh, what should we do about climate change? That's like way, way, way too big. You have to think much, much smaller than that. It is ba it's evidence-based um, and you need to draw upon whatever sources that those might be. 
focus on what the meanings are. Do not, it's not one of these things where like it's a scientific paper and you focus on the methods. People don't care how you got to the conclusion. People just want to know what it is that you found. They're going to trust you on the methods. And somehow you have to relate it to the big picture, the things that, that society as a whole uh, cares about. So here's kind of an, an overview of all the different things that are elements uh, of a policy brief. So first, what societal problem are you trying to solve? Um, who's your audience? Why should they care? And what's the problem with the way things are today, the status quo? Because 99% of the time, literally, things are gonna stay the same. So you're gonna to have to convince people to take action. And that means that you need to show evidence that there's a sufficient problem that's worth their effort to take action on this versus the many, many other societal challenges that are out there. You need to understand the arguments against your proposed action. Um, even if you're doing an advocacy brief, people are gonna say, well, like, but what do these people think? What do that, those, these other people think? And you need to have your arguments that, that say, okay, this is why they're wrong. Um, you know, you're not, you're not really arguing as much as the facts, but you're arguing about the perspective um, as to what they have. And then you want to, what you want to be very clear as to what you want the policymaker to do and how they would respond to what I call the four E's, which are effectiveness, which is the degree to which the societal goal will be reached. Efficiency, which is what's going to get the best bang for the buck. The equity, talking about the winners and the losers and ease of political acceptability, which is talking about the degree to not really, it's, it's not as really as much politicians, but really the degree to which people will support or oppose an action. You know, people might say, oh yeah, that's fine and not be willing to really advocate for it and, and, and encourage it to happen. Um, and that's not gonna get you very far. Uh, if people though have strong opposition, then, um, then that will also sort of change. Um, change things in terms of how they will be. So, uh, so here is again kind of the four E's. Uh, those of you who have seen my presentations before know that I sort of talk about these. These, oops, sorry, these don't come just from me, but from policy analysis literature and uh, how you're supposed to kind of look at different policies. So the most common mistake that I see people make uh, from the scientific and technical community and general community is a focus only on that first E, effectiveness. And they sort of think, well, if it's effective, why isn't it happening? Well, you know, there's a lot of reasons that things aren't happening. And some of it is because you don't really, you're not really thinking through the actual implementation. But if you're a policymaker, you have to think about all these things. You're gonna have to think about how much will it cost? Who's gonna get mad at me uh, if I implement this? Um, you know, who is it going to hurt uh, as, as opposed to help? So these are all things that you need to know the answers to as part of your policy brief. And this might go well beyond, you know, whatever your research dissertation is on. But it, still, if you want to have action, then you need to, you need to be able to answer the questions that the policymakers have. So um, in this, I put in chat a folder that has all this material in it. I just want to kind of show you overall what these look like before we get into them in more depth. So this is um, from FAO. I really, the, the guidance that I gave earlier on policy briefs is, is from a very long document that the uh, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization has. And they produce a really great set of uh, policy briefs. This is one that I, I particularly like, uh, which talks about achieving sustainable development goals requires investing in rural areas. It's, it's very well designed. And so I have set, you know, for the people that I teach, this is the design that I have adopted for a policy brief because I think it's very effective, it's attractive, um, gets all the information across in a short uh, form. So these are two briefs. Uh, this is one that um, I myself wrote. So part of what I do uh, is I'm a consultant for West Virginia University for their bridge initiative that uh, is on science and technology policy. And we produced a policymaker guide called the Waters of West Virginia uh, that was uh, you know, released earlier this year. And so that's an example of like a longer document. The full document is like a hundred something pages, but as we meet with policymakers and so forth, we wanna focus on certain areas uh, of the guide you know, when we're, when we, uh, so that we can be more effective in our message. 
And so I just, like I said, this is just kind of so you can see what a full one looks like. You'll see in the folder, you can um, actually like read it, but, I, but I'm gonna go through some of the key elements. The next one I'm gonna go over, uh, oh yeah. So this is basically how a policy brief looks on Forefront. So what I did is I took the policy brief that, that one pager and put it on to um, Forefront. And you can see at the top there, it's like a five minute read, which sounds uh, about right. And uh, you can, that it's not that hard I found to copy from basically our template that we have, you know, into this, uh, into this format. It probably took me like 15 or 20 minutes. So it, it'll be pretty easy to do. I mean, so you wanna develop it separately from the, from the um, uh, medium platform and then paste it in. And then like I said, it shouldn't take you very long. Uh, here's the, the other one. So this uh, is one of the PhD students uh, that we work with, whose name is, um, uh, uh, you know, Rachel uh, Yesenchek, and she uh, put together this one. Uh, and this is again another element that's of the same uh, Waters of West Virginia report that talks about uh, issues related to flooding in West Virginia, which is which is a big um, concern. Okay, so now I'm going to go through each of these different um, areas just to kind of emphasize what they should be like. So the first thing is to consider your title. Um, and um, the, um, yeah, the, uh, let me see, uh, let me see. Uh, this one, for example, like you'll see each begins with an action word. So here, achieving the sustainable development goals requires investing in rural areas. So it tells the policymaker the societal goal is achieving the sustainable development goals, which for those who don't know, come out of the UN. Um, I feel like it's something, area, something else I don't feel a lot of people know as much as they should about, but there's, there's um, these like 17 goals and things like you know, reduce poverty and no hunger and things like that. Um, so, in, in the United Nations world, they're, they're very well known. And it's very clear what the action is in terms of investing real area. And it's short, it's like what, one, two, three, like eight, eight to 10 words. Uh, so here's the other one, which is um, talking about um, advancing West Virginia's rural community, drinking water and wastewater systems to enhance rural economic prosperity. So again, you sort of start with an action word you start with what it is that you're trying to do and your societal goal, you know, which is just like here, it's like investing in rural areas here. We're saying we're trying to enhance rural economic prosperity by uh, advancing these um, systems. The one uh, below uh, is update West Virginia's floodplain maps to reduce the financial and personal toll posed by flooding. So it wasn't just not that long ago, about five or six years ago, that West Virginia had a major flood that, that killed a bunch of people. I think about, I can't remember, like 70, 80 people. Um, it really caused devastation to certain parts of, of West Virginia. Uh, the challenge here is, is that the floodplain maps are out of date. Um, and so if people knew more, things would happen. So that's why we're talking about here, reducing the financial and personal toll. Uh, because both of these uh, these activities occur, and in West Virginia, this is this is uh, this is well known. Okay, so the next uh, focus area is sort of your key messages. So your key messages, you really want to have um, three things: sort of uh, findings, uh, conclusions, and recommendations. So here's the one from the FAO that's an ag uh, about agriculture. So the message here is through agriculture or non-farm employment, many rural poor have improved their incomes and escaped poverty. Oops, sorry, hold on. Um, and then the, the conclusion here, the findings, basically that investments made to connect rural and urban areas and improve services have potential to reduce poverty and create jobs. So that's basically why we should do this. And then they're, you know, they can't make recommendations at FAO, but they can propose actions, which is a little bit different, options for action. 
So basically saying new strategies are needed to leverage the untapped potential of food systems through agro-industrial development. So the action is very clear. So this, this uh, second one here is the one that's on flooding, the flooding in, that's in West Virginia. And here, uh, the finding is basically that inadequate and inaccurate FEMA floodplain maps uh, for West Virginia put homeowners and businesses at risk because people who need flood insurance don't know that they, they need to um, get it. Um, and the sort of the factoid here we have is that only 60% of these vulnerable structures are covered by flood, flood insurance in West Virginia. And so the recommendation is that West Virginia's policymakers partner with FEMA, that's the Federal Emergency Management Administration, to reconstruct and update the floodplain uh, maps. Uh, this other one, this is about safe drinking water. Um, so this basically talks about the fact that safe drinking water in West Virginia has long been a concern because there's challenges in managing both drinking water and wastewater. But the challenge is, is that pretty much all of West Virginia, according to definitions, is a rural state. And very sometimes you have very small communities that you know might be less than 50 people, less than 100 people. And so it's really hard for them uh, from a financial management staff standpoint to, metro, to do these more centralized systems. Um, and so the key, then there was two recommendations uh, here that we're focusing on, which is that there should be coordination of these regional approaches so that, um, that can, so people can work together and, and, and reduce the, uh, improve economies of scale and reduce the cost of residences by not having, you know, each community have its own system. And there also needs to be matching funds because there are federal grants available. But unfortunately, these communities are so small, they don't have enough money for those matching funds. And so that limits their ability to apply for them, much less have the resources to know how to apply for them. So that poses a challenge. Uh, the next section is having some sort of uh, data graphic uh, that really sort of brings together information and shows that you're actually basing this again, not on opinion, uh, but on data. So this, uh, this one here, the, the, this, uh, uh, the where it says figure one, changes a portion of urban, rural and urban poor. Uh, they're trying to show here the main um, aspect in terms of where poor are. And it goes to the, uh, the statement they made earlier about non-poor rural areas. So you see here, that's the bottom darker green. And they're showing that the non-poor and rural areas is actually increasing. While your, your assumption might be that people in rural areas um, are poor, but actually it's, it's been getting, getting better. So this is the data that kind of that shows that uh, change. There's one down here on uh, water systems. Uh, in this case, they're showing, it, it's showing that if you look at the darker one where it says failing, so what it what it shows is that there were that, that improvements are being made in terms of like the darker red are de were decreasing for a while there, um, but in 2014 uh, it was 19, but it went up to 25 for failing systems in 2017, and that's sort of basically the latest data that we have um, available. And so it's saying, hey, you thought things were getting better, but actually they're getting worse in terms of of uh, drinking water, wastewater systems. And then uh, the other, uh, this other one up at the upper right where it says percent population living in a hundred year floodplain. Uh, so this is uh, so that people can see like where, you know, where specifically if their county um, is at higher risk than they might realize in terms of a floodplain area. So all these things help a policymaker kind of think, okay, yeah, there is, you know, they're right. There is a reason to take action. It's not just something to think about. So having that supporting data graphics is important. Sometimes you have to do an original one like this one here in the upper right about the population living in a hundred year floodplain. That's for one of the faculty members at West Virginia University. Sometimes you need to just highlight something. So the one on uh, the water system trends, that's something from a, a regular report 
but it might not have been highlighted enough. Um, and so these are just ways to, to really emphasize your point. Now, the next section is basically saying, why should we care? Um, and uh, so this is these sections, I've just put the headlines here, but the, but the description under each one is saying why, why it's important to take action and gives, you know, we kind of said it a little bit earlier, but here's a chance to expand in like a paragraph or so as to why, why the, you know, we as society, as policymakers, why we should care. And then this is again, is just a little bit part of the, what can be done. So these can be options for actions. These can be recommendations for actions, but it again, expands a bit more um, in terms of what is, uh, what we've already said on the first page. We're now on the, we've been now on the back page, uh, giving more details. So if somebody really cares, they will have enough to at least get started. And of course, if you have a longer report, a longer analysis, then you'll refer to that. Okay, so we're about to, oops, oops sorry, Jane, stop. I'd like to stop. tell you the story. Ah, there we go. Uh, so before we go, I, I'm about to go into our activity, but I wanna stop here and say, does anybody have any questions? Um, let me see here. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so uh, oftentimes it's, you know, the one thing about the, the question was about like international, local and so forth. Yeah. So uh, on Forefront, we're really open to anything. Uh, so we don't view ourselves as a U.S. centric activity. There are articles on lots of different things. Uh, so another question here is the difference between a policy brief versus a science um, note. So uh, as you know, Rachel's the one who's sort of the expert here on, on science notes, but it's basically, um, you know, like I so said, to me, it's, it's more like it's a facts map kind of thing. Do you want to expand further, Rachel, on that? Sure. Yeah. The main thing with science notes, so those have a really particular format um, where they don't make policy recommendations and they um, uh, point out some like limitations in the science, like what we know and what we don't know. So they're a pretty specific format and they're very um, informational rather than making policy recommendations. And so a little bit different, they can be a little longer. So the length might be a little different as well um, mm -hmm. than a policy brief. Yeah, and I think, you know, for a policy brief, you know, you may or may not make a recommendation, but you certainly do have options for action. Like you, you would never give a science note, like the titles that we have, you know, like advancing this or doing that, because it's meant to be, you know, you know, like just here's the situation. Um, and, you know, while the, the policy brief is saying, okay, well, what should we do about the situation? The, um, let me see here. Okay, so uh, I would say, okay, well, policy briefs and, and serious memos are somewhat similar to each other, but it's, but, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, things that, that uh, what I should say, by the way, I did, I did not follow, I did not introduce myself, but I did work for the Congressional Research Service uh, for um, about three years. And uh, part of it is that, you, you're, that you're given a very specific format. So most of the, say, uh, reports that I did, what you commonly see, those, those might be relatively long. They might be say 20 or 30 pages. Uh, they have, uh, um, and you'd have an executive summary that was limited to like a single page. And that single page at the beginning of a CRS uh, report as an executive summary is very similar to a policy brief. Now, since I left, there is also uh, something which I think they call in focus. And that is more similar to a science note in that it, it brings together the information like, you know, like what is carbon capture or things like that, but it, it doesn't like go as far as a uh, policy brief. Now, a lot of what I did when I was at CRS is the less public documents. So they do have actual memos, confidential memos that you write. So a policymaker might've asked me to do some sort of analysis, but it's only for that person, that individual. 
And though, because those are confidential, they're not published. I had one that like made it into the congressional record one time, but generally speaking, they're just like the policy memos or uh, policy memos that you, um, you probably have done in, at previous uh, events where they're directed to a specific person, in this case, usually a member of Congress, um, you're doing analysis, you're giving policy options. At CRS, you're not allowed to make recommendations. So it still only gives options. Uh, sometimes I would ask the, whoever I did my policy memo for to turn it into a, um, a CRS report. And generally they would say yes after they're, because generally they're developing legislation after it was introduced, then it would be, um, uh, then I could, I could do it. And they would want me to put it into a report. Uh, because then they're trying to convince other people. And so all the facts and things like that that I put together for them, it's now in a public, uh, public document. Um, let me see, is there anything else? Yeah. Yeah, and Holly, uh, put, what's nice is that it used to be when I was at CRS, CRS reports were, uh, you weren't allowed, CRS was not allowed by Congress to publish them. They changed that law a couple of years ago and now it's like one of the best places to go as your first step for any analysis that you do. Okay, so any more questions? Okay, so this is what I would like you to, to, uh, to do. And I'm actually going to try, I have my uh, YouTube version here that I thought I would, oops, try to go to my other version here. So let me hit stop share on this. Okay, and so what I, oops, let me share. Okay. Okay, so what I'm hoping um, to do, um, share, uh, and Rachel, maybe you can let me know if, if everybody can sort of see this. Uh, so this is an episode of the uh, uh, West Wing, and it's about Pluey the Wolf. Now, uh, I, I often use episodes of the West Wing to illustrate points, and I'd use this one, um, you know, sort of pretty often. Uh, but I'd like to um, uh, this time make you think about the different um, aspects of it. So as you, as you watch this episode uh, about, Plu I should say, I, I, let me go back further back. I realize that some people amazingly do not know what West Wing is probably because some of you were born after it came out. It's that old, it's like 25 years old, that's still relevant. So West Wing was a show about the White House and uh, it was kind of like the kind of the White House we would kind of all would like to have. Um, and uh, so there's a number of characters and one that you're gonna see, is, her name is CJ Craig and she is the White House press secretary. And this is what they call Block of Cheese Day and Block of Cheese Day goes back to like, I think it's Andrew Jackson where people could actually walk into the White House and present their idea. And there was a big block of cheese that people could eat while they were waiting. And so the president, uh, President Bartlett, uh, you know, wants this big block of cheese a day to happen and he's making his staff listen to people. And so in this case, we have some you know, scientists who are making a presentation. And what I want you to do as you watch this is think about these elements that we talked about, which is what is, um, what title would you give? If you were like, if you were actually at one of these meetings you would probably give them a policy brief, right? So the question then is uh, what, um, what, what would be the title in the policy brief you would give them? What would be your key messages, like your finding, your conclusion, your recommendation? You know, why should they care? And so I want you guys to kind of like write this down as you're thinking about it. And assuming we have time, I'm hoping that we can do a breakout session where you guys can exchange this information with each other. Uh, otherwise, we'll just do it in chat. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started and hope that everything works. Okay. Nothing. Uh, I, 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 was, I was thinking of a different, 
Nothing. CJ, we'd like to tell you the story of Pluey. Who's Pluey? I'm glad you asked. That's Pluey. Yes. Pluey's a wolf? Yeah, she is. And you're going to tell me her story? Jerry. For four years, scientists have tracked Pluey as she made her way from Banff National Park in Alberta up and down the Rockies. In that time, she's made three round trips between Canada and Wyoming, covering 40,000 square miles. We think you'll admit it was a pretty impressive performance for Pluey, especially when you consider the impediments of modern life she had to conquer. Highways, housing, forests, denuded of trees. Not to mention the U.S.-Canadian border. Sure, because no photo ID. <laughs> I'm sorry? That was a joke. Why does Pluey make the trek? Because wolves have to breed with many packs in order to keep from becoming extinct. Really? If they breed among themselves, they'll eventually produce offspring that's genetically weaker, thus endangering their long-term survival. That helps explain Buckingham Palace. <laughs> May we tell you what we propose? Sure. The wolves only roadway. The wolves only roadway? 1,800 miles from Yellowstone to the Yukon Territory, complete with highway overpasses and no cattle grazing. An 1,800 mile wolves only roadway? Pluey, you'll recall, had to hang up. How are you going to teach wolves to follow road signs? Our scientists are working on a plan. Yeah, but in the meantime, Pluey's going to get drunk and wander off the wolves only road and end up eating my cat. We don't think that'll happen. I don't think this is going to happen. Perhaps we should. First of all, ranchers don't want wolves returned to the West. Ranchers are killers. No, they're not. And anyone who says it should take it back. Ranchers face the following conditions. Falling stock prices, rising taxes, prolonged drought, and, and a country that's eating less beef. Ranchers want to blame something, and because they're ranchers, they want to fight something. I'd rather it be a wolf than us. So unless Pluey registers to vote. Pluey was shot and killed by a rancher in British Columbia last month. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm not sure you are. <clears throat> Just out of curiosity, how much would it cost? That's the beauty part. With contributions and corporate sponsorship, the cost to the taxpayer is only $900 million. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, seriously, how much would it cost? CJ. If we're going to do this, why not do it right? <laughs> we're not going to do it. Well, sure, there are other things we could spend the money on. You think? I'd like to hear what you think. What's a better way to spend this money? $900 million? Another war plane? Another SNL bailout? How about we build the nine best schools in the world? Let's, let's move on to the grizzly bear. Hi. Hi. Can I talk to you? What you got on my spot? Okay, so uh, did you guys uh, enjoy that episode? How many of you actually watch, uh, have ever watched West Wing? Yeah, good. I'd like to see some, some West Wing folks um, out there. Okay, so let me go back here to do this. I always tell people that, um, if you, you know, like we talk a lot about, at least I talk a lot about uh, policy uh, analysis. And, but, you know, I'm, I'm a policy person. I'm not a politics person. So I've studied politics and as part of my like PhD program and so forth. So I, I know what, but, um, you know, I'm not like a political operative kind of person. Um, and so, uh, a good way to kind of really understand those dynamics um, is to to watch uh, West Wing, especially the first couple of years. It gets kind of like you know crazy as many things do after a while. But when Aaron Sorkin was writing in the first like four or five years, it, it, it sort of really makes sense. Okay, so uh, what we have found out, uh, which I was unaware of, is that because of the version of Zoom that we're on, we cannot do breakout rooms. However. We can um, have people uh, 
uh, provide information in chat and we can sort of raise people, uh, allow people to ask questions. So what's gonna happen is that Holly uh, is going to um, put people, in, change its, everybody's status so they're a panelist. Uh, and so she can, um, so people can sort of ask questions more directly and provide their comments. So as you see here, I have several different um, things here. So what I'd like to first see or have everybody sort of put in chat is put in your engaging title about Fluey the Wolf. So let's just kind of take a moment to do that. Okay, so glad to sort of see things here. Okay, so let's uh, start kind of going through um, some of these. Um, uh, so let's um, let me see. Uh, so we have Ben here who's got create specialized highways to protect our wildlife. Um, yeah, I think specialized is maybe a bit too techy, but um, I think you're on the right track. Uh, also, you're talking about all wildlife, our wildlife as opposed to just wolves. And, you know, of course, the case they're making is just for wolves, not for our wildlife. But good, good, good start here. Um, paving the road to survival for wolves. I kind of like that one. That that really seems to um, get to. I'm not really sure. It's. I mean, it's not this uh, this highway or bridge or whatever. But it it does. Uh, but it does have that kind of uh, paving the road. I can I can sort of see that. Um, keeping the American wolf alive, a little bit too general, that could mean many different things like banning all guns and things like that. And of course, that would make a lot of people mad. Um, protect wolf population with dedicated highway. Uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think that uh, that works. It's not particularly passionate like the one above it here, keeping the American wolf alive. That's that's a little bit more passionate. Uh, build highway, save wolves. And you see that one, you know, I don't think most people are gonna get that because, you know, most of the time you have, you won't know that it's some special highway. And so, um, you know, most of the time wolves might get killed on a highway, right? By a regular highway, by a road. Uh, protecting the long-term sustainability of wolves. I think that's too techy long-term sustainability, what does that mean exactly? Um, okay, something, you, I have no idea why we're talking about Heidi. Is it Heidi the wolf? I don't know, Holly. Uh, let me see, preventing extinction of wolves with dedicated highways. That one's pretty good. Because people, most people know what extinction means. Uh, paving a path for the lone wolf. Oh, I kind of like that one. It's got that word paving again, uh, but I don't know. Lone wolf also has some negative connotations. Let me see. Saving wolves requires a safe passage to their destination. Um, it, it just, I think it's too general. Uh, you know, because safe passage can mean, okay, yeah, we're gonna load all the wolves on trucks and bring them to Canada or something. Uh, protect wolves with special wildlife bridge. So I, uh, I think, you know, I like that one, um, except for, you know, I, maybe if you put that word paving in, in there somewhere, but, um, but that one I think is, is a pretty good idea. So uh, any questions on sort of like the title aspect of it? Okay. Okay. So um, Let's just, uh, since I'd planned for this to be a little bit more interactive than it can be, 
uh, let's just let's just go to why should we care? So what are what are some reasons that pe people should care? Um, let me see. So question, does a catchy sensational title dilute the message? Uh, no, because you're desperate most of the time to capture attention. So in, in political science world, this is called agenda setting. So what these people are trying to do in this, in this particular episode of West Wing, uh, portion of West Wing, is they're trying to say, hey, you know, wolves should be at the top of the agenda. So when you think about uh, another good example is like NIH and the, you know, like all the diseases, right? So if you're one of the 5 million health problems out there, you're desperately trying to get some attention for your activity. So, uh, you know, like I said, obviously you can't do too sensational kinds of things, but you can't go too techy either. Uh, and because that's, that's not who you're trying to reach, you're trying to reach a more general population. Um, okay, so let's just do one more thing, which is basically talking about why should, why should we care? So why, why are they saying we should care other than, I mean, like a wolf is like a nice creature. Is there any, anything else? Okay. Uh, yep. So keystone species, I think that's, uh, that's good. Um, ecosystem, protect ecosystems. Yes. Oh, let me see who knew this research shows wolves promote ecological balance by stabilizing the water table. Are you just making that up, Tristan. Is that really true? I don't really understand what that means. <laughs> okay, so he says it's true. Yeah. Uh, Yellowstone, yes. References to Yellowstone, good, good things to do. Um, uh, you know, so I think, you know, like one uh, other ways to think about it is, is to think about other things people care about, like the deer population, right? People are worried about deer. Um, and, uh, the challenge is in, in my part of Pittsburgh, deer literally like walk across the street in like the middle of rush hour. <laughs> and so you can imagine what this is like sort of late at night. Okay. So um, yeah, so I think uh, hopefully this, this little exercise has kind of helped you to, to get used to thinking about, you know, what your particular um, topic is. So I just, uh, Jay, we oh, don't. sorry, here we go. So I just kind of wanted to end here by talking about some of the elements of a, um, uh, a good policy brief. So the first is the title. Does it get the reader's attention? So like I said, you're trying to, to get through. There's so many things coming at policymakers. It's, it's really hard to do it. Um, we didn't really talk too much about the summary, but the summary is just really just a few sentences to that really kind of says, okay, here's what we're going to tell you about. You know, some people, you know, they're going to look at the title. They're going to see if the title interests me. They're going to do the summary of the first two things. And if it doesn't fit their agenda, then that's it. That's as far as they're going to go. So that's why that those first things, the title, the summary, the box, um, you know, like so many people will, will not take time beyond that to, to read. And nobody really reads from beginning to end anymore. Um, so the next thing is sort of the context and importance of the problem. Um, you know, so is, is it really explained, defined? Uh, is it really focused on what the root causes are? Um, and that is, is something that is often uh, people focus on the surface. They don't really focus on what's causing the problem in the first place. Um, you need to also make sure that you have your policy app options clearly outlined and that you, it's not advocacy, it's analysis. And so what that means is you're looking at each of these things. And so you're willing to understand what the pros and the cons are and incorporate them. And again, even if you're advocacy, you need to acknowledge that some people oppose it for this reason, 
But this is why we think that that is not a good reason to oppose it. Uh, you want to make sure that your recommendations are clearly related to your findings and your conclusions. And then you want to think about actual practical steps, like how are you going to implement those actions? If you were the person who is in charge, what is it that you would do? And then you want to make sure you have sources of information and their links. So uh, I guess another question I sometimes get is, what about references and things like that? Um, the uh, what I what I prefer these days is not footnotes, not endnotes, but linked statements. So like you get like you should never for every data point, every time you put anything quantitative, you should you know like put a hyperlink under that number and link to the original source. Uh, so that I think is the best way to do it. Now sometimes you know you will be at a meeting or something like that, and and obviously they can't, and you're giving them a piece of paper, and they obviously cannot hyperlink but this is a good reason to follow up and say you know thank you for meeting with me or chatting with me here's a digital version of the policy brief um it, you know and it you know it if you look at it it'll be easy for you to find the sources of uh evidence that we have by just clicking the appropriate links or something like that uh so i think that's a, a better way to do it or you know if you're referring to a longer report like in, like we're doing in the west virginia case you know, they can always go look at that if they're interested. Uh, but that's the best thing is, is um, hot linking, you know, any sort of uh, references or information, because people really do want to go back to original sources if they, if they get serious um, about Debbie, it. There was a question yeah. in the chat about what is a good source. So aside from the format of the sources, what could you say a little bit yeah. about what would be considered a good source? Yeah. So what would be, yeah, so a good source would be from a, a reputable institution. It does not have to be an academic paper. In case, I would say in most cases, it will not be an academic paper. Uh, it often will be something from a, um, say, a, a federal agency. You know, so like, just like some of the data that we talked about with flooding and things like that, that came from either federal agencies state agencies, things like that, government. So government sources um, will often have the best policy oriented data. Uh, another place is uh, the National Academies, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. You can be safe signing from them. And also a variety of think tanks around town. So if you cite something from you know, Brookings and um, some of these other organizations that do a lot of like white papers analysis or the Center for Strategic International Studies, somebody who has a reputation in the field, uh, resources for the future, another good example. So you, you need an organization that has a solid reputation in DC uh, and is not viewed as uh, politically biased and is viewed as analyst, not advocates. And uh, you don't want to, you know, like cite something from, I don't know, Sierra Club because nobody's really gonna trust that data. Um, uh, you know, concerned scientists, very iffy. You know, if it's an advocacy organization, then people are gonna always uh, worry about the quality of the data. Um, let me see, any other questions about these? Yes, I would agree, Rachel. It, it, it can be DC or where, wherever it is that you're at, you know? So in West Virginia, where I'm at, really West Virginia University is like the primary source of information besides the state government and, and so forth. So uh, if, it's, if you're doing um, international work, OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, you know, they have very solid sources. Um, so there, it's really for whatever, whatever your audience will believe in. That's really the way to think about it. Uh, you know, like some of this data, some say international data might not work. Um, like I, I, for example, got in trouble once on a report that I was working on where I cited data from a report uh, from China. And, you know, I got sort of like attacked for it by like the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> he, said, he said, this is not true and all these other kinds of things. And so there's sometimes when you use international sources, uh, you know, people will be wary. So I could have probably kept it in, but I would have said some question this data. Um, and unfortunately, this Wall Street Journal person had written an article 
that I did not know about that questioned the data. But if I had known about it, I would have said, but some people question this data. And then, or, you know, and then I would have hi hyperlinked to the Wall Street Journal thing. Um, any other general questions? Okay, well, that is it for me. And I think we're going back to Rachel. Okay, give me just a second here. Sorry about that. Okay, so now that we've talked about what a policy brief is, um, I'm gonna just walk through a little, real briefly how to submit a policy brief to the competition. Um, so everything is going to run through the Forefront platform. Um, and so that is on Medium. And so what's required, first of all, is that you become a writer on Medium. This is a, a free process. Um, it, there is a paid version if you wanna read a lot of articles on Medium. So um, you, might, you might come across that, but it is free um, to be a writer and to submit things to our platform. So you become a writer. Um, usually I would advise you know, writing something in a Word document or a Google document and then copying it into Medium um, when, you're, when you're ready to submit it to us. But you'll, so you'll write a story on Medium. So that's this first step here, write. Um, you then save that writing as a draft. So don't publish it on your page, um, but save it as a draft. And then when it's in its draft format, there's an option to copy a hyperlink to that draft. So then um, once you have that link to the draft, you have your article written, you're ready to submit it. Um, then we have a submission form on the Medium site. Um, and I'll go back and show you uh, where that's at on the site. So here's the, the homepage of the Medium site. There's a, a menu item called Submit at the top, and you can click on that Submit button, and that's where you're going to submit your article. There's, um, it'll take you through the guidelines for the piece, and then there'll be a form at the bottom of the page where you submit. It's going to ask for your name, contact information, uh, like I mentioned, your LinkedIn bio, and then it'll ask you for that link to the draft of your article. If your article isn't formatted perfectly, um, don't worry about that. We're going to go through and we'll make sure that all of them are formatted consistent, consistently before they would be published as part of the competition. Um, and so once you submit, um, we'll send you confirmation that we received your article, and then um, that will get for the competition, it's going to go out through an initial screening process um, where we will be looking for those criteria that I mentioned at the beginning. If you make it past that initial screening process, then um, we'll begin to work with the editors on um, getting, your, um, getting you feedback on your article, on your brief. And then we'll also then um, be recommending articles that will be the top articles and brief, the top briefs of the competition. And those will have prize money associated with them. And then um, as we're going through the editor, editorial process, we'll get you feedback and then we'll ask you to revise those drafts. And then ultimately um, you'll submit it for publication to the, to the Medium platform or to the forefront page on Medium. And then we'll make sure it's formatted appropriately at that time. Oh, okay. Yellowstone wolves, not, not a question for me. Um, question from Holly, is there a way to have co-authors on Medium? So there is not a way to have co-authors on Medium, unfortunately, um, but it's very easy to note who your co-authors are. And so it, what it's looked like for others who have co-authored papers is that you have your primary author submit via the Medium platform. So they'll be listed as the official writer of that or author of that article. Um, but then at the top of the page in the byline, you can list who the other authors are and their affiliations as you see fit. Any other questions about the submission process? Maybe I'll just back out of this quick and I will um, show you the, the page and kind of 
show you a live version here. So um, medium.com backslash SciTech Forefront is how you find this page. Um, I, we can put that in the chat so that way you can go directly here. On this page, uh, most you'll be able to see examples of the articles. Um, and then up here is the submit page. There's an about us page where it lists a little bit of our background. And then these other um, tabs here are different articles. You can also find information about the NSTN competition. If you are, are forgetting the dates or want more information about the scope of this, you can go there. Uh, the, the recording for this workshop will also be posted there. Other events will be posted there. And then um, down here, so we do have one example and Debbie also mentioned another example. If they are examples for the competition, they're going to be branded here with this um, graphic where it says the 2022 policy um, writing competition on there. Um, so that way you can go to those and see examples of what these will look like. And then I'll also take you to the submission page real fast and show you where the form is because it's a little tricky. If you go to that submit page, um, again, there's going to be some instructions here about our types of submissions, the review process and guidelines. And then you see the submit using this form, you'll click on that and it'll take you to a Google form where you'll be able to submit the article. So I'll go back I don't see any other questions that have come in. So I'll go ahead and go back and talk a little bit about some upcoming events associated with the competition. How soon should you expect a response? Um, Holly, that might be a question for you. I believe we plan to do the first round of edits. And so you'll find out if you are going to be included in the competition, um, like move forward to the second round of review by the end of May. And then um, in August is when we will announce the winners. And yes, I believe we'll inform you if your piece is not accepted. Any other questions about the competition details? I'll let you add those to the chat and then I'll talk about a couple of other opportunities that are associated with this. So this, um, this next workshop that I'm going to mention here is not a, um, you don't have to participate in this if you're part of the memo, uh, the, I'm going to continue to say memo competition. I'm really sorry about this. It's not, it's the, the writing competition this year, <laughs> brief competition. Um, if, you, if you are part of, if you are planning to submit a piece for that, you can attend this. If you're not planning to submit a brief, you can attend this workshop. It's going to be an eight week workshop series um, that has two parts. The first half of the, um, the course is going to be focused on reading scientific writing and summarizing that. Um, Genevieve Bourne is going to be leading that portion of it. She is a PhD student at Johns Hopkins and um, has a very interesting method that she's developed for reading and critically analyzing scientific papers outside of your field um, in a quick and efficient manner. And then during the second half of the workshop, I'll be leading a, a four week mini course on writing for policymakers. Um, we'll talk about briefs, but also more broadly uh, writing skills, essentially just expanding on um, what Debbie has, has talked about in this course here. And um, some dates on that. So that course is planning to start on March 1st um, and it'll run through April 19th. It's eight weeks for an hour and a half each week on Tuesdays from 6.30 to 8 Eastern. Um, they will be online synchronous classes and then we'll have some asynchronous activities that will happen outside of the classes. And any, it's, oh sorry, it's open to any NSPN member um, and there will also be a participant participation certificate at the end of it. Okay, so then we have a question from Ben. Any suggestions for coming up with ideas in researching policy options and costs? Coming up with ideas. So, and you're, I think you're referring to ideas for the, the like the topic or focus of your brief. 
So I would say um, when I'm thinking about topics, typically the first thing I'm going to think about is a problem that there are policy solutions to, to solve that problem. Um, and so you can think about this as something within your discipline that you know um, there may be issues or it could just be something that you see happening in your neighborhood or, you know, with you that you experience as a member of society and you think there should be a policy solution, a science based policy solution to that problem. And then from there, um, Debbie can talk a little bit more about narrowing down topics. I know that I, I, um, I tend to have trouble with the narrowing part, but you want to be as specific as possible on that topic and try to, you know, identify the problem well enough that um, there's a specific solution that can solve it. Debbie, can you add on that? Yeah, so, um, so what I typically suggest students uh, do, you know, well, well, uh, and I realize some of your students, some of you are not students, but I think if everybody is students, no matter what their age, because I teach professionals as well, um, is, uh, is to pick a topic that you're interested in and, and type it into Google News. And that's really a great way to sort of see like what's happening. So let's just say that you care about wolves, okay? Since we've been talking about wolves today. And, and I can almost guarantee you, if you type in wolves into uh, Google News, again, new, Google News is different than regular Google, you know? Uh, there'll be some, some controversy about wolves. I don't know, uh, that that they're killing deer and we're having a low deer population or raccoons. I don't know what it's going to be. They just got relisted on the endangered species list. You know, well, there you go. Like Perfect. So they just got put on the endangered species list, right? Okay. And so that's what, it, that I find is a really good way because you can find out, you know, like what Rachel said at the beginning, she said, what is society concerned about? And what's in the news is what is on society's mind today. And so uh, you know, for the competition, you can do anything you want. In fact, what I often encourage people to do is, you know, particularly if you're like in a general field, like, you know, like sciences or physics or chemistry, something like that. And you don't have, you're not peep, somebody who's already focused on an issue like in the energy or in the environment or something like that. Then, um, you know, what you want to do is have a connection of some kind to whatever the topic is, whatever it is that you're passionate about. Because you know, any scientific and engineering or health field can apply to whatever topic that you're interested in. Um, so like, for, as an example, like in the Waters of West Virginia study, we talked about health, why? Because you know, increased um, heat, more water means more mosquitoes, which means more diseases, uh, vector-borne diseases and things like that, right? So the world is like so connected. Um, so that's, that's where I would suggest. Now, the other thing uh, you're talking about was cost. So with cost, um, I think you would be surprised that there's, if you actually start looking, there is information out there primarily from the agencies themselves. So the first thing that I would do is, is you need to understand the status quo. The status quo meaning the current policy. What is going on now? And uh, like, I remember I was sitting in somebody's, it was like a PhD dissertation, you know, event. And this person was proposing something on this island and they would have this cable that would go and bring the wind power to shore, right? Well, the cost of that, if they'd figured it out, would have been more than the cost for the like entire agency, you know? And so you can get some idea in terms of the range of cost if you really look. Uh, a lot of it will come out of national laboratories, but they were are pretty good about doing cost. Um, but that's that's where you'll generally need to find stuff is it's usually government kinds of things that provide cost information. So hopefully that answered your question. I think it was what Ben, right? Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay. And then um, it looks like Rachel, you put in here uh, how to register for the uh, event, which is good. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yep, so that, that's on there. And then, um, so I'll go back to that. And since I see there's some other questions, how many hours of asynchronous work is expected? Depends on how long it would take you to put together a draft of a, of a brief or a policy writing piece. Um, 
I would say that outside of class, there's maybe like an hour or two of work a week um, until you get to the end. If you can get a, a good draft put together, we're going to do peer review at the end of the course so that you can get some feedback on your brief and, or if you choose to write something different. Um, so that might take a little more hours, but during the first half, primarily outside of class, you'll be asked to read papers. Um, I think she's Genevieve has two or three scientific papers that you'll read throughout the four weeks um, and look at them and try to analyze them using this um, method that she's going to teach you. And then during my portion, it will be, you know, picking your topic, identifying the audience, outlining your brief and identifying important information, and then um, putting together a rough draft of the brief. So hopefully something you're already going to be working on um, is will be the asynchronous work that you'll be doing for it. So it's, you know, six, six so 12 hours of in-class synchronous time, and then it would be, you know, probably another six to 12 hours outside of that. And one thing, uh, other thing I wanted to sort of mention is that, you know, it's really important to have an individual writing sample that you can use when applying for jobs, fellowships, things like that. So when I was on the hiring side, when I was at the, the National Academies and other places, um, you know, that would be the first thing that I would ask for, you know, uh, when it's for fellowship programs and so forth is give me a writing sample, because what I want to see when I'm hiring somebody is, can they be a translator? Can they translate scientific and technical information for a general audience? You know, a typically a general educated audience. So it's not like the wider general public, but it's people who are interested in the issue um, and, they, and they want to know uh, more. Um, so I would encourage you for like this course um, that, that Rachel's working on, as well as this policy brief for the competition, to think about it not as just something for the competition, but as something that you can use in the future to apply for whatever it is you end up doing. Now, even if you go into industry or if you go, you know, you know, in a variety of other places, having a writing sample that's very handy um, is, is always good. And as as Holly just said, you know, it's really important to to just do, you know, follow your passion. You know, that's the thing, that's a good thing about public policy is people just care about you, you know, that you can like look at a, uh, you know, piece of literature, you know, like we're talking about here and you can understand it <laughs> and say, okay, so that, you know, uh, I mean, I would literally, like when I was at the Congressional Research Service, I might have a stack of like 20 papers and I would have to go through them in basically like 20 minutes, you know? And for a lot of people, that's very hard to do. Um, so, you know, these are things that you really want to, um, to think about. So I see a question, I think for you there, Rachel. Uh, no need to have anything prepared in advance for the training series. Um, if you have an idea of the topic, uh, come with that idea, but no need to prepare anything in addition to that. I, before I, I will um, stop sharing my screen so that way we can all uh, look at each other a little easier. Um, but I did just want to mention that in addition to that training series, um, so if you don't want to commit to the eight week course, we are also going to be doing a um, bring your own brief uh, science policy writing peer review hours um, over the course of March and April before these are due. Um, so those dates are listed here during that time, you would just expect to come uh, join on Zoom, and then we would uh, match you up with someone who can help walk through and give you some peer review on your brief. And even if you just have an outline at that point or want to talk about an idea that you have, that would be a perfectly appropriate thing to, to do during those review hours. Um, Debbie or I should be on all of them. And then we also will have some of our forefront associate editors who will be joining on there as well. So they can talk a little bit more about um, the review, review criteria that we use and what we mean when we say, you know, that it's formatted properly or that it uh, meets the scope of Forefront and things like that. Um, so those dates are also on the website for the competition and the registration link will be up soon. And then I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we can um, stay on as long as we need to answer questions for you. Yeah, I, I do want to mention one other thing is that, you know, if you, part of the reason that, that we pick Medium is that you we can publish you can publish things right away, right? So um, 
as an example, at least the big news, at least in my neck this <laughs> last week, was the issues regarding Eric Lander and the White House Office of Science Technology Policy and bullying in science and so forth. And they and I was just looking on LinkedIn yesterday, and there's some like really great pieces that are out there that people are just like putting on their personal blogs, you know. Um, and so with Forefront, this is the, one of the advantages we have is that when an event like that uh, occurs, and I should say I worked for Eric Lander for three years when I was at the White House, um, then uh, this is a place where you can express, you know, your opinion. Like I, I was on, um, what event was I doing the other day? I was on some event, oh, the other day, and somebody, um, oh, I remember it was with the ESCP, the, the Engaging Scientists and Engineers and Policies event for AAAS, and I've sort of talked about some ideas, and then somebody brought up, okay, well, that's a real challenge with international students, and that an person really helped them, you know, achieve that. Well, that's a great piece that you could do right now for Forefront. You don't have to wait for the official memo competition or things like that. Are there, if there are things you just like to write about, then you can, we're the place to, to come to, particularly for things that, that are um, timely. Um, and then our goal is to try to connect those through social media to, you know, to more major news outlets. Um, and then, you know, also keep in mind that you can publish something the way we have things worked out, that you can publish things on a blog, republish it on, on Forefront, that is perfectly allowable. Um, and it's also true that if somebody goes and sees something you have on Forefront and they want to publish it, you know, they want to try to publish it in Scientific American or something, that's also okay with us. So, um, you know, that's, I think that's a, that's one of the main reasons that we did this because we wanted to respond to events in a timely manner beyond what you can do on Twitter, <laughs> you know, um, to more analytical, more, more evidence-based. So please, you know, please consider that as well. And then, you know, we're also are, you know, always looking for associate editors, you know, so if you've had experience like with JSBG or something like that, you know, please do apply to be associate editor. Uh, one difference between us and JSPG, and I'm on the board of JSPG, so uh, it's it's not uh, anything against them, is that, it, that if you're an editor there, you can't publish. With us, you can publish and also be an associate editor on uh, Forefront. You just have somebody else looking at your article. So those are just other things I just wanted to add. The caveat, though, is that you cannot be an associate editor and take part in the memo or in the brief competition. Yes. Um, exactly. So you can't participate in the competition and be an associate editor, but if you decide not to submit or um, after the competition is over, we would love to have you as an associate editor. Okay, so any uh, other questions out there? Are you now ready and raring to write that policy brief? Okay, I'm gonna put in one last, uh, last uh, note for Forefront here. If you have a memo that you have written in the past that has not been published, so let's say you submitted to a competition last year and it wasn't accepted for that competition or, or for publication, and you still would like to get that published, submit it to Forefront and we'll um, go through the review and hopefully we could publish it so that way it's something you could include on your resume um, and as a writing sample as well. So uh, definitely if you've written blogs in the past, if you have other pieces of policy writing that you haven't been able to publish, um, send them our way, even if they're not part of the competition and maybe you can get a few um, different publications out of this too. Yes, and just kind of add on top of that because I know um, some people submitted writing for say uh, applications for fellowship programs for say the AAAS fellowship program or things like that. This is another good place that, you know, uh, anytime you've like written something for somebody else, uh, and it was just to try, well, like I was looking at somebody yesterday and they were, they wrote, you know, they were writing something for, um, a, you know, a fellowship kind of thing. Um, you know, you can always publish it, publish it with us. And so that I always feel that there's a lot of like really great analysis that's kind of lost, um, just because it's not published. So you're writing, I have it for my students. Um, and they've written something for my class. I, I suggested that they republish in um, uh, forefront, you know, so they take a policy brief that they wrote for my class, you know, put it up onto forefront. It gives them something that they can really show something they can link to on a resume or in a cover letter or things of that nature. Um, 
to do self things. So like I said, think broadly about any sort of policy writing you have. Uh, one thing that's really great about Medium, it's just like so easy to do. Literally, like I said, it took me about 15, 20 minutes to take the policy brief that I that was in this kind of like publisher Google Doc format and put it into the Medium format. It was, it was very, very easy. And uh, yeah, so the long-term um, access um, for the folder, we'll keep it open, you know, as long. And we'll also put maybe other things in there as well. Uh, so we have the you know, these three policy briefs, uh, but I there's others I have as well. And so I'm going to put them all in that example section um, as as uh, as things come up. So. OK, so I think we might be at an end. Holly, do you have anything you want to chip in and say? I think for me. I'll just remind everyone the deadline for the sign policy writing competition this year is May 2nd. And we're really looking forward to seeing all your submissions. If more questions come to mind um, in the meantime, or depending on the website that seems confusing, please always feel free to shoot us an email. Uh, and we'd love to collect more of your frequently asked questions as we're trying out this new, new style this year. So thank you guys so much for your time. And again, this will, video will be posted uh, within the next week or so on our competition website so others can view it and you can share it with people. Um, and thanks so much for your question and participation. Thanks everyone. Bye everybody, good luck. Thanks, bye.